On Thursday night, the news agent sat down with First Minister Nicola Sturgeon in her office in Holyrood for a wide ranging conversation on all of the politics which is dominating Scotland right now and the UK, trans, the union, independence and more. First Minister, thank you so, thank you so much for coming on the news agents, allowing us into your wonderful office, You're very the welcome. Scottish Parliament. Um, since actually we're recording this on Thursday afternoon, last night was Burns Night. Mm. You have a busy Burns Night yourself? Wild time? <laughs> Ours was a bit quiet, to be honest. We were wandering around central Edinburgh thinking, where's the party? I, I didn't go to a Burns Supper last night. I, I was working until quite late last night, although I did have some haggis uh, to eat. Marvellous. Uh, later on, but I've got a big Burns Supper in my constituency on Saturday night, so I'm ah, looking forward to that. Marvellous. Burns they... season extends not just uh, to the end of January, but usually well into February well, in Scotland. Well, <laughs> that, that's good to know. More haggis, the better. As far as Absolutely. Um, look, I think we want to have a conversation about uh, obviously the politics of the day, which we'll, we'll come to, but also just about you and your... Oh, no, nobody told me that. Yeah, 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 yeah big time. Uh, and your, you know, your extraordinary longevity. I mean, you're actually now, I suppose, in a way, it makes you sound a bit like the Queen, I suppose. Please but, uh... don't call me some kind of elder <laughs> stateswoman no, 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 or no, something. No, 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 a veteran, that's the worst a thing. You get that, be... That's even worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, get, you spend, uh, like, talking about John Sopel as a veteran journalist, he gets very upset about that. Yeah, but that's uh, true, unlike uh... <laughs> me. Don't tell me I said that's that. That's true. Uh, he won't, he won't hear but you are sort of almost one of the few constants in British politics now. You know, in an era of complete tumult globally and particularly in the UK, you've been First Minister for eight years, going on eight years. You've been uh, a minister for, what, since 2007 in Scotland, so 16 years. You're on your fifth Tory Prime Minister. Uh, at the last count, yeah, the, but I mean, yeah, things well, could have changed just, in yeah, the we'll last half hour. Let's just exactly, assume yeah. for the sake uh -huh. of argument. Third Labour leader in Westminster, fifth Lib Dem leader, seventh Scottish Labour leader. How do you think you've survived? Why have you survived while all of these dominoes have fallen? Well, you know, that's a question to ask other people, I guess. No, the, the, the thing you didn't include there is I fought, you know, many, there's probably only been a couple of calendar years in all my time as First Minister that I have not faced an election, mm. um, a Scottish Parliament election, a, a Westminster General election, a local council election, a European election. So there have been plenty of opportunities for the public to you know, cast their verdict on my tenure as party leader or more importantly as first minister. And we've won, my party's won all of these elections, uh, not narrowly, but but comfortably. What does that say? Uh, it must say that the people of Scotland, or at least the significant chunk that vote SNP, are satisfied with the way I and my government are leading the country. Um, they won't think we're perfect because we are absolutely not perfect. And I think probably more important than any verdict on an individual policy area, I do believe there is a sense in Scotland that the SNP, whether people agree with us or disagree with us on individual issues, that we've got the interests of the country at heart and we do our best for the country are and you, our instincts are right. Are you perhaps just a bit better at politics than some of these people? Well, I'm far too modest to say that, but, on, you know, I suspect, us. well, look, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I, I actually don't, <laughs> people will not believe this about politicians in general, or about me in particular, I should say that up front, but I don't feel naturally that comfortable talking about why is my party and, and me as a politician as successful as we are, because I, I do think, A, that can sound a it's bit smug Scottish, and complacent. It? Definitely not very Scottish, and and Scottish people won't like it, um, but also, you know, I'm, I'm one of these people, as my family would tell you, I've, I've got a de terrible dread about tempting fate, so as soon as mm. you start to pat yourself on the back, something terrible is going to, that is very Scottish as well. Um, so I, I don't, look, I think we have governed well. I think we have led the country uh, well through the pandemic. And we've got a vision for where we want to take Scotland. And it's imbued with hope and optimism, well, even must, in tough times. It must give you, I hear what you're saying about being modest, it must give you a little bit of satisfaction. Just a little <laughs> bit, come on. I don't, again, you know, people think politicians are you know, horribly Machiavellian all the time, and sometimes we are. But I don't take, I actually don't take great satisfaction. If you look at what happened uh, with Liz Truss, for example, mm. I took no satisfaction in the chaos and political destruction that she caused in Even such a short period of time. Even though she called you an attention time. seeker and so on. Well, we'll, put, we'll come on to that later. But the damage she did to the country, that affected the living standards, the mortgages, the livelihoods of lots of people I represent and people across the UK. So, yeah, of course, as a, as a politician, you prefer when your party's up and other parties are down. I wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't believe me if I said otherwise. No. But I don't take 
pleasure or satisfaction in any political leader who's doing real damage to people's lives. But you are in a unique position because you have been around for so many of these politicians who have come and gone, including prime ministers who have come and gone. As a practitioner of politics, as a, as a you know, formidable analyst of politics, if nothing else, which of the prime ministers that you've dealt with did you find the most formidable opponent? See, that's interesting. And I'll answer, I'll, the one I had the easiest personal relationship with, and by easy, I don't mean that he was a walkover. That's not mm. what I mean by easy. But the one that I was able to do business with easiest, and I suppose, I don't know whether he would agree with this, but I felt I had the best personal rapport with, mm. notwithstanding our very deep political differences, was David Cameron. I thought you were going to say that. Um, Theresa May, we didn't have that same personal rapport. I think maybe that was just a reflection of both of our personalities. But I had a great deal of respect for uh, her in the sense that you never went into a meeting with Theresa May unbriefed because you, whatever else you thought of her views and positions she took, she was always absolutely on top of the detail, worked ferociously hard and I think did her best, albeit in a policy I fundamentally disagree with Brexit, to, to steer her party to the best position she could. Boris Johnson, I mean, I don't really know what to say about Boris Johnson. It was impossible really to, to do business. It was bluff and bluster and, you know, anything difficult just got passed off to somebody else. I'd, you know... Did you ever say to him, look, we need to, we need to focus? On yeah, this. I mean, I remember one meeting in particular uh, of the four nations where it was in the midst of COVID, we were meant to be talking about that and sort of longer term stuff. And well, firstly, it started horrendously late. This was meant to be a big kind of almost a strategic meeting. He came in late, blustered, and then basically left after, I don't know, I, I want to say 10 minutes, it probably was longer than that, but not very long. And, you know, we're all left kind of sitting there. And I remember saying, I said to him afterwards, <laughs> one of the last conversations I had with him, um, probably wasn't the last, and he was proposing another of these meetings and said, because that last one we had was very successful. And I said, well, Prime Minister, I beg to differ. I mean, it was completely unfocused and we didn't really get to talk about anything. <laughs> he said, well, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Boris Johnson, I, I just, you know, in a category of his own, I suppose, and um, maybe he would take that as a compliment. He probably would. Yeah, but I don't think it, it's not meant as a compliment. I think he, and actually, I think we're still living with this. He kind of degraded the whole political space and, and you know, the, the sense of probity and integrity in government in a way that I think will have, you know, a, a legacy for quite some time to do, come. Do you think he's corrupted British politics to an extent? Um, in a general sense, yes. I mean, corrupted is a, a word people will use in a very sort of particular mm. sense, and obviously I want to be careful not to, right, to do that. But in a general sense, are the general standards and accepted standards and things that are now just taken, you know, almost as read that previously... I mean, you, you take the issue of... And I don't particularly want to get into this, but it's just a, an illustration of the point. You know, if you'd cast our minds back... Uh, you know, I don't know, a year or so, when all the debate was, you know, a Prime Minister getting a fixed penalty notice, it would be a resignation matter, Keir Starmer having to say he would resign if the same happened to him. And then, what, last weekend, a Prime Minister gets a fixed penalty notice and there's... Now, you can argue whether this is right or wrong, and there's almost no real, you know, debate about mm -hmm. it. So, already the bar has been lowered. And I, like and that is that one... Sense. Yeah, and, and so now people just... Things have been normalised by his behaviour that not that long ago we would never have believed were normalised. So I'm only at Prime Minister 3. Yeah, well, quite. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Well, now that's all we've got time for. Let's trust. Uh, I never really got to no. do anything with. Rishi, you know, let me also say, they would all, you know, give you a commentary on me, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm sure. perfect here. They would all talk about my flaws and everything. Rishi, the, the jury's out. He certainly is trying to engage more on a one-to-one -one basis. But as I've said to him, and I think the First Minister of Wales would probably make this point too if he was sitting here, it's not just in the, can we have a nice chat over dinner? It's, do you actually, in substance of what you're doing, show that you respect the devolved parliaments? And I don't think there is evidence of that I've yet. I've always been intrigued by these these dinners to take place. You shouldn't be. Well, <laughs> They're not that intriguing. <laughs> All right, okay, well, then tell, then tell me, because... On one level, I assume at some point you will say to say Rishi Sunak, just take us into the room. You'll say to Rishi Sunak, well, frankly, you know, you'll reference the independence question. 
you'll reference another referendum. And how does he react to that? Does he just sort of look shiftily and, and, and awkwardly and say, well, I don't want to talk about that? Or, or how does it go? Or does he actually confront it head on? Or do different prime ministers do so? I mean, they all you know, have their different sort of way of saying we don't respect Scottish democracy, which is effectively what they're saying. They all do that slightly differently. And Rishi, on that question, you know, we, we actually spent most of the time when we were together for dinner a couple of weeks ago talking about the NHS and, you know, things like that. But there's just a very, well, 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 you know, Scotland had its referendum and all the rest of it. So I think, you know, I would say he's not keen to engage. And I would say he's not keen to engage because he knows particularly one-to-one. Do you like to press it home? Do you like to make it more more awkward? I I don't go in particularly to make it awkward, but I do believe that Scottish democracy really matters. And we can have, as as we did, I think, that night, a, a debate about whether independence is a good idea or not. I think it is, just for the avoidance of doubt. Really? Yeah. Oh, good, I'll, just, I'll just skip that question then. I'll just cross that out. Um, we can have that debate, but where I don't think he's got a leg to stand on is on the question of should Scottish democracy be respected, the mandate for an independence referendum, the majority in the Scottish Parliament for that be respected or not. Well, since you talk about um, elections and the potential for a mandate, as you said, you've had most years where you've had an election or whatever to, to think about. Most people will hope that there isn't going to be one this year, but there almost certainly will be one next year. There'll be a general election. Just thinking about how that might play out, because most people assume there's going to be a Labour majority government given the state of the polls. Now, that is actually quite an assumption to make, because the actual leap that Labour needs to make, particularly if we take Scotland out of the equation, let's assume that they do. I'm happy to do that, well, of course, sure for the future well, I'm sure, general elections. Yes, I suppose, I suppose you're happy to take Scotland out of the equation, full stop. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the, the uh, threshold they need to make in terms of the seats they need to win is very, very big. So still, actually, a fu- an underpriced possibility for the election is a hung parliament. Now, Labour have said that they, and Keir Starmer have said, they just will not engage with you about negotiations about another referendum, even in the event of a hung parliament. You've said in the past that a Tory government is the worst outcome for Britain, and especially for Scotland. So are there, presumably then, there are no circumstances in which you would allow the Tories to stay in office in the event of a hung parliament, even if Labour refused to talk to you about another referendum? Well, look, I've, so in the, I think, what, three general elections I've fought as SNP leader now, I've always said that. If the parliamentary arithmetic lends itself to this, I will always, you know, have the SNP vote in a way that locks the Tories out of of Downing Street. And Mm -hmm. that's my position and that will continue to be my position. Um, I would sort of reverse that, though, and, you know, is Keir Starmer in that position going to, you know, not take the opportunity to get the Tories out because he won't talk to the SNP? And I think but, that is a ridiculous but if, but if thing. You, but if you just said that you would always Look, vote to get the Tories out, then you've got no bargaining power with Keir Starmer because Keir Starmer will just say, well, you've just said yeah, that. Yeah, but so. Keir Starmer will have to get other things done if he wants to, you know, have a, a so meaningful... like a Labour budget, for example. Well, look, there's, I'm not getting into the specifics because we're some way away from this, but... You know, if he wants to govern as opposed to just, well, of course he'll need to talk to the SNP if we were to hold the balance of power. And I just think, you know, what Keir Starmer, and I, incidentally, I don't believe Keir Starmer on that. I think if we get into this scenario, he will be biting the hand off of the SNP leader uh, to try to work together. And so he's I, lying when he's saying that... Well, I don't, I don't believe, I'm not going to use uh, that language, but I don't believe that that will be the position he is is in. He's also... You know, again, and this is, I think, even more difficult for a Labour leader than for a Tory leader. He can oppose independence, but there's many of his own party members here in Scotland, actually, or supporters perhaps more than members, support independence. And even more who would absolutely think it is for the right of the Scottish people to to choose. And what he sounds, you know, he doesn't agree with the SNP. That's fine. We're, we're opposing political parties. But if Scotland votes for the SNP in a general election, as it has done in the past three general elections, then by saying he won't work with the SNP under any circumstances, what he's effectively saying to Scotland is that the democratic choices of Scotland should be ignored and they don't count, they're not legitimate because people in Scotland are not voting the way Keir Starmer wants them to vote. That is a horrendous position for a politician to so, So to be clear, I'm just trying to understand the mechanics. You would definitely allow a Labour government to take office. You'd get rid of the Tories because you just like the Tories. But what you're saying is, is that if they are not willing to negotiate about your priorities, which obviously your biggest priority is securing another independence referendum, which you say you've got a mandate for, 
then you would be potentially willing to vote down a Labour government, a Labour budget, a Labour What I'm saying is, if any, this is a a particular um, statement of fact, any Prime Minister that wants to go, and I'm not just, I'm not trying to set here, John, and I'm not getting into specifics of budgets or Queen's speeches or anything, but any Prime Minister that wants to govern as opposed to just sitting in Downing Street in a hung parliament, you know, the SNP has been a minority government in here. You have to work with other parties to get your legislation and your policies through. So the idea that Keir Starmer wouldn't have to work with the SNP and come to agreements and compromises with the SNP in that scenario is just not credible. Changes the game though, doesn't it? Having a Labour resurgent, even if not in Scotland. Because one of, well, because one of your strongest arguments for a long time has been that the Tories are disliked in Scotland. Scotland never votes Tory. And the fact of the matter is, is that like yourself, a lot of Scots who even vote for the SNP, let's be honest, their second preference would be a Labour government or their preference in a national election would be to have a Labour government. So it does remove one of your I'm not sure it does. And actually, the polling, for what it's worth, doesn't bear that out in Scotland. You're not scared of Labour? Uh, no. And I've, you know, I don't mean to be complacent, but I've not really had any reason as Keir uh, SNP does, leader to Keir be... Keir Starmer doesn't strike uh, you no. as, a more, as a more formidable opponent for the SNP. Than who? Than previous Labour leaders over the no. last decade. No. In no way? Not particularly, no. You're not impressed by him? Um, I'll come on to that in a second and again try not to be personal about no. it. I, I had some good interactions with Keir over Brexit um, and actually his position now is one of the reasons I, I've lost a bit of respect for him. But let me take on this point. So this issue, this is, goes to the heart of the, the democratic case for independence because right now Scotland, you know, every single person in Scotland could vote Labour. They're not going to. It could vote Labour, and if England still votes Tory, we end up with a Tory government. That's the We're in this position just now where we've just got to cross, cross our fingers and hope that at a general election enough people in England uh, don't vote Tory for us to get rid of a Tory government. Independence is about never having to put up with a government we don't mm. elect democratically. Mm. It's fundamentally different. But to come back to your point about Keir Starmer, I hear this a lot in Scotland, and it's one of the fundamental reasons that Labour, apart from their anti-democratic position on not so much independence but a referendum, why I think they're going to really struggle to have any kind of recovery in Scotland is people people don't want a pay limitation of a Tory government. So you take Brexit, it is inexplicable to people in Scotland that we've now got a Labour leader at a time when Brexit is as unpopular as it ever was in Scotland, but increasingly unpopular in the rest of the UK, that won't even countenance going back into the EU or even the single market and the customs union. He seems to, on everything, when people, and I think this is, you'll know better than me, but I suspect this is true across much of the UK, people are crying out for a genuine alternative to the Tories, and instead they're getting this triangulating, you know, sort of fudge the difference, just be a sort of slightly more palatable version of the Tories from Keir Starmer. I don't know that that's what people want. And my, if I was in Labour... In the sense that he used to say things about Brexit, he doesn't yeah. think he's unprincipled. Well, I don't know how you can go from being the Keir Starmer that I and the SNP worked with over Brexit um, when Theresa May and, and Boris Johnson were Prime Minister to be somebody who now don't, won't even countenance the possibility of going back into the single market and say you've got uh, principles. But I, if I was in Labour, and I'm not, so I'm having to imagine myself into this position, what would worry me if I was south of the border in Labour more than anything right now is, you know, Labour, you said it seems inevitable that Labour win the next general election. One of the things I've learned over many years in politics is you never treat anything as inevitable. Indeed. And I, if I was in Labour, I'd really worry about the whole just be the pay limitation. Because that's not, why would people vote for the pay limitation? Uh, you know, he needs to have a bit more principle, a bit more difference, and actually a bit more guts to take on the Tories and to take on the right-wing media well, as let's, well. Well, let's think about why people might vote for you at the next election then. Because you said you want the next general election would be a de facto referendum. That's what you said when the Supreme Court um, vetoed the idea of another referendum. Now, there's going to be a special conference, SNP conference in March, to decide the exact approach. There's now talk about maybe that the... Uh, election is effectively an endorsement for you to seek another referendum. Why the change? Because you were There's very not a emphatic change. before. I, I, my position hasn't changed. I'm, I, I appreciate this might be novel from a, a Westminster perspective. I'm trying to uh, ensure 
some internal party democracy on this issue um, because it is a big. Let me say first of all. Well, I remember the, watching your speech where you outlined what your approach was going to be, and you said that if the if the Supreme Court went the wrong way, yeah, you said that's that still the my, next election would be a de facto yeah, referendum. Yeah, and that's still my position. I'm just going to explain what the SNP conference is going to do. But actually, before we get to that, it's important. I still think the way to decide the question of independence is a referendum. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't cool. changed my position on that. But if that is blocked, there has to be an alternative way for Scottish democracy on this issue to express itself. My view is as I set out. But this is a big decision for the SNP. And by extension, it's a big decision for Scotland. There are two, I think, credible options for that if a referendum remains blocked. One is the position I've set out, and that is uh, my position. The other is for the next Scottish Parliament election to be the de facto referendum. What's your preference? I've just told you what I set out before, the Westminster. So that's still your preference? My, yeah. my position hasn't changed. But I do think on an issue of this magnitude, rather than me simply say, because if I simply said to my party, it's my way or no way, you'd be sitting here saying to me, why don't you trust your party to look at the different options and, and come to a, a decision? And that's what uh, I want the party to do in, in March. So that whatever the party decides, we come out of that with a very clear collective decision that we move forward but on. But let's, let's say your party do accept your recommendation, what you would like. How is that going to work? Because the other parties won't accept it. They just won't, won't accept, accept what? it. They won't accept that this is a de facto referendum. You can declare that it's a de facto well, referendum, in a sense, but they won't accept it. It's, it is obviously on a, a particular issue, but I'll be doing what every party does in every election. I'll be saying, this is what we're standing for. Here's the, the manifesto you know proposition. That any kind of referendum or well, any kind of independence, see, it needs legitimacy. It needs all part. That was the great strength of the 2014 well, look, referendum, because it has sense, legitimacy across all sides, and this wouldn't. I know this is an interview with me, so you're scrutinising me, but... That's not the position I want to be in. So yes, uh, is it a perfect way forward? No. Are there flaws in it? Yes. But we can't have a situation where every democratic route, I sit here with interviewers saying, ah, but the Westminster parties won't accept it. Because then you're in, well, what is the democratic route for Scotland to take? So if the other parties think that doing it through an election is inappropriate or you know, not the, the, the best way to proceed, fine. Well, let's agree the best way to proceed, which is a, a referendum. That's democratic. It's what there is a mandate for. But at sooner or later, they have to say, if all of the routes that we are trying to, uh, to pursue, simply to give people in Scotland the right to choose are to be blocked, then what is the democratic Well, well indeed. So maybe, I mean, maybe you have to start thinking about very, very difficult decisions. I mean, for example, would you consider SNP MPs not taking their seats? After the next election, because if in a sense, if Parliament, but you would, you would the, sit here and no, say, I, well, no, but it's not about what I would say. Well, I'm just thinking you're right in a sense. The the system is blocking you off yeah. at every direction. So if you keep winning and you still don't get what you want, at some point, I assume you have to start thinking about quite novel. Well, as it happens, I, I I am and, and I'm going to continue to be you know a fundamental believer in the power of democracy to prevail, and I think the power of democracy will ultimately prevail. Getting there, I'm against a bunch of you know, sort of dem democracy disrespecting Westminster politicians is frustrating, but I believe democracy will prevail. In terms of what you said to me there about withdrawing, you know, MPs from Westminster, you know, I'm not sure that would be the thing that made the difference. And while Westminster is still taking decisions that have a big impact in Scotland, I think it's important that we have people there standing up uh, and making Scotland's voice heard as much as is possible. But this, I'm the one... I'm not complaining about this. I know this is part of my job, but I'm the one that is always getting asked the question, ah, but what do you do if Westminster continues to stand in the way of Scottish democracy? And I am trying to find ways of having Scottish democracy respected and upheld. Sooner or later, there is going to have to be on the part of, not I'm talking about you personally or news agents, but the media in general, is to ask that question of Westminster politicians with do. as much regularity and fervour as it is asked of and me, we do, because it, it is it them is, that are blocking democracy. Uh, well, and we do, and it is incumbent upon them. But you've like, I mean, I was really struck by, you know, you gave an interview on BBC on Sunday with Laura Cooper, and you used a, a phrase which I thought was really, really striking. You compared the way the British government was acting as if they were a governor general. That has overtones of colonialism, of imperialism. Do you think that the way that Westminster is acting at the moment in some way could be compared to treating Scotland like a colony? Uh, no, I, look... I, I wouldn't go down the road of describing it as colonialism. The Governor-General was used in a particular context 
of the Secretary of State using a never-before-used power to veto a democratic decision of the democratically elected Scottish Parliament on a piece of legislation. Now, you know, you don't have to extend that to start saying, which I wouldn't say that Scotland is a colony, to say, no, actually, I, I, that's I how you would expect you would a Governor-General sure, to... Sure, I, I wouldn't think you would necessarily yeah. think Scotland is a colony, but the, there are... There are overtones well, sometimes look, in the way that, because there has been, and I think you probably agree with this, you, there has been a move in a way that, say, the Conservative Party has oh, started absolutely. to treat, so over the last 10 years, by comparison to, say, oh, Cameron so, in that period. Uh, totally, and, and particularly since Brexit. So people... The so-called muscular unionism. Well, I, I would call it stupid unionism, to be honest, because the idea that they think that will save the union it is literally demonstrating each time they act in that way the reason why Scotland should be independent. You know, the UK is supposedly a voluntary union of equals, uh, but they seem intent on showing people that it is anything but, and that the word of Westminster prevails regardless of democratic decisions in yeah, Scotland. in a way, that's true. I, mean, I think your, well, your case in many ways is intellectually unarguable in one sense, which is that Scottish political will has been consistently ignored. It's been ignored in 2016. Scotland hasn't voted for any of the governments we've had since 2005. Uh, you've had Have Boris... we suddenly swapped places? No, 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 but let me finish. <laughs> Boris Johnson, you know, was probably, couldn't be more genetically better created to rub lots of Scots up the wrong way. Deeply, deeply unpopular. We saw what happened in 2021. And yet, support for the union, I mean, you know, nip and tuck with what happens in the polls, but it's always around 50% or so. Why do you think there's something, of, the, the union remains strong in a sense, doesn't it? We always talk about the strength no, of nationalism. No, I don't think, I, I think, I think that well, it's about a... about 50% of the population, well, despite all of these things. Yeah. But you Things say that again. You I, I talked earlier on about was it the moving of the Overton window and stuff, the sort of normalisation of things. It's not that long ago where if you'd said that support for Scottish independence would be anywhere near fifty percent, you would have been laughed at. Mm. So you know that is a significant advance on. You know, I was going to say when I was first in politics, but long, long after that. You know, the twenty fourteen independence referendum when it kicked off in earnest in what twenty twelve or something. Independence was very rarely, if ever, much above 30% in mm. the polls. So, but every day there is a demonstration of the, you know, the, the, the undemocratic, unequal position of Scotland within the union. And you don't have to, you don't have to be you know, a sort of lifelong nationalist now to, to see that. And mm. your point about this muscular, which I described differently, unionism, on the Section 35 veto uh, last week, you know, it was put to me, oh, but it's never been used in 25 years, so it's not going to be used um, very much in, in future. Actually, our experience is very different. Until just after Brexit, this other, the Sewell Convention, which is that the UK Parliament doesn't legislate in devolved areas without our consent, that had never been breached in almost 20 years. As soon as it happened once, it then started to happen, and it's happened several times. So you think Section 35 will happen again? I think if they, if they are able to sort of that to be allowed to happen and to stand and for there to be no challenge and for there to be no uh, sort of parameters drawn around that, I think we will see a UK government use that much more. Um, and I, that is, I would, I've had people in my own side of the independence argument over the years say, you know, the Tories are capable of abolishing the Scottish Parliament and, or completely taking away significant powers. And I've, I've always resisted that. Don't be, that's hyperbole. Let's not go down that road. Now, I still don't think it is likely that they would try to abolish the Scottish Parliament. Am I 100% sure of that anymore? No. But short of that, I do think there is a concerted effort to undermine, delegitimise and remove powers from this Parliament. But you're not completely sure, certain in your own mind anymore, i.e. there's been a change, that at some point there might not be a move within the Conservative Party to try and abolish the Scottish to Parliament. You know, whether they would do it full frontally, as explicitly as that, but the, the process that they're engaged in right now is about... You think some of them about, would like to? Oh, down. absolutely. Some of them would like to deep down. But there is a process underway right now of removing powers, removing status, legitimacy uh, from the Scottish Parliament. And, and that means, in my view, the, the independence debate, and it, for a whole variety of reasons this is true, but on this point particularly, it's no longer about a status quo or, or, or independence. You know, it's arguably about independence uh, or a situation where the limited degree of devolution that Scotland has already got is going to be eroded and eroded and eroded.
So, I mean, given we're talking about Section 35, let's talk a little bit about what's really the news of the day and what everything, the debate in Scotland around trans rights and around gender. Now, I, I kind of want to have a slightly different discussion about it because I think this debate just gets so lost in you know, extremes and so on. And so I just wanted to start with by asking, was there a moment where you thought you wanted to do something on this, on this question? Because presumably it isn't something, this is an evolving debate that's had taken place over the last 10 years. Was there a moment when you thought, I don't know whether it was a constituency matter or a constituent or, or whatever it was, was there, was, it, was there a moment you thought, there's, this there's is something I want to, to do because you've paid a political price for it? I'm not sure there's evidence of, of Well, your party is divided. What I mean is your party is yeah, divided. But I'm, so I'm, I think, but, you know, I think it's we've got controversial. To be, you know? It's controversial. I grant you that. It's controversial. Um, controversial in ways often that actually have no bearing on the, the specifics of the, the act that was passed by the Scottish Parliament. But to come to your question, I, I have over you know, all my time as First Minister um, had, I don't know how many, but a number of conversations with young trans people who you know have have told me that the you know the i suppose the the struggles they have the mental health problems they have the trauma associated with many aspects of being trans which has made me feel not just on this because the process of getting a gender recognition certificate is one aspect of living your life as a, a trans person or transitioning um in that way so Yes, I've had many occasions where I've thought I would like to make life a bit easier for trans people who are mm. already very stigmatised and, and vulnerable. Um, but there was a moment in the 2016 Scottish Parliament election, there was a, a hustings, uh, which I think, if memory serves me correctly, it was held by Stonewall. And all of the Scottish Party leaders were there. So it was me for the SNP, uh, Ruth Davidson for the Tories, Kezia Dugdale for Labour and I think Willie Rennie for the Liberals and I think Patrick Harvey was there for the Greens. And the question, we not long in Scotland uh, legislated for equal marriage and the question then was, are, what are you going to do about gender recognition? Because the current system of getting a gender recognition certificate is inhumane, intrusive, traumatic for people. Every single one of us committed to that reform on that platform. So the idea that this has always been controversial that was a commitment that I think was in all of the party manifestos in 2016. Um, in yeah, 2018, the UK government put forward proposals to do this when I think Theresa May was Prime Minister. I think she still supports changed, it. it. The Tories changed on at Westminster, changed their mind on this issue. Now, they've got a right to do that, but there was quite a significant degree of political consensus around it. Now, a lot of what has been uh, dominant in this debate are fears, very real fears and very legitimate fears that women have. And I'm a woman, I've experienced these fears at times in my life and I absolutely understand them of what predatory and abusive men can do mm. to women. I don't question the reality of those fears. The point I have made and will continue to make is that reforming the process of getting a gender recognition certificate is not what creates or exacerbates sure. this fear. Men don't need a gender recognition no. certificate and to access women-only Sure. And, and before I ask you these questions, I, I actually want to say, because I don't think probably actually it's said enough in these debates and by interviews, that, you know, as you've already alluded to, First Minister, the vast, vast majority of trans people have no interest in assaulting anyone whatsoever. They themselves are more likely to be assaulted than others. The biggest threat to women remains men who are born men who consider, continue to consider themselves men. But nonetheless, the fears and legitimate concerns that you talked about have been crystallised by the case that is dominating all the news today. And First Minister's question today of Isla Bryson, previously known as Adam Graham, currently effectively in solitary confinement in a women's prison. Now, you said at uh, First Minister... I'm not sure that remains true at the well, moment, well, well, yes, but, yeah. at, at the time of recording. You said at First Minister's questions today uh, that that will no longer be the case. Indeed, by the time this goes out, it may no longer be the case. Did you or the SPS, the Scottish Prison Service, make that decision? The SPS made that decision. I mean, the SPS would have known my views on it, but the SPS made you, that decision. It's no, an operational... Your government are, had no input in the decision at all? Uh, look, I... The, the way in which government officials will speak to agencies of the government, the SPS will have been aware of my view uh, on the matter, but it is an operational decision for the Scottish Prison Service, as it should be. And the, the thing is, first point I should make, because it's not always made, is that this 
uh, issue of trans women in uh, female prisons has got nothing to do with the gender recognition bill that's been passed. Mm -hmm. Even if that bill was in force right now, it would not have an impact on these decisions. The Scottish Prison Service does robust risk assessments on an individualised basis of, of these cases. There are a very, very small number of trans uh, women in the prison estate in Scotland right now. There's no automatic right to be in a female prison. Many of them are in male prisons. Sure. So given that, would you like to say that in future that this should never arise again? Well... That there should simply be... Well, we saw what... I don't know if you saw that the Shadow uh, Home Secretary Yvette Cooper said today, that anyone who had been convicted of sexual assault against a woman should never be in a woman's prison. So Would I, you agree with that? I, well, I said today, the Chief Executive of Rape Crisis Scotland said it very bluntly yesterday, it, it's impossible to think that a, a rapist should be in a woman's prison, and I've said I agree with that. What I would say is the, the risk assessment process, I believe, should reach the right outcomes in these cases. But in addition to that, the Scottish Prison Service is already undertaking a, a review of its gender recognition policy in terms of transgender prisoners. So there will be you know, a reflection in that process of some of the voices that don't often get he heard in these debates. But your, but your government could have a very, could just have a, a policy. As, as Yvette Cooper is essentially saying, that, that should anyone convicted of sexual assault should just never be in a woman's prison. Well, Why not just commit there to is, that? There is that review underway, but the, the, the process that is in place right now should lead to the right decisions there. And, and that is, it's important that there is the individualised approach why, to Why? Prisons. Because some people, some politicians don't think that's the case. Yvette Cooper and others clearly don't think there well, should I, be an individualised approach. Look, it should just be a blanket I'm here, approach. I'm here to speak to, for myself. I of don't course, know what Yvette Cooper has said. Other, other, I agree but, that there are other, I'm just saying that there are lots of politicians who just think there should be a blanket. They think that's common sense. And they say that a lot of the public would agree with them well, on that. Why not just have that commitment? There is no difference in, you know, in terms of the, the way in which the Scottish Prison Service does this already. Uh, certainly until very recently, recently perhaps as yesterday, to the way it's done in other parts of the UK. Uh, and I've said very clearly today, I don't think it is, you know, I, I think as a general principle, uh, somebody who rapes a woman should not be in a female prison. I have no uh, difficult. I've said it in Parliament on... Uh, more than one occasion today. But I do think when we're dealing with the prison population generally, there needs to be that risk assessment approach that doesn't... Because the danger with taking a blanket approach to anything, and I, I accept what people are saying about the blanket approach here, the danger of any blanket approach is you end up having a different effect to the one you want because you catch uh, cases that should be dealt with in a different way. So I think the individualised risk assessment process uh, is is strong, but I do believe there is effectively what I said today. There should be a presumption that somebody who is convicted of rape is not in a woman's prison. But just a presumption, not a guarantee. Uh, I think the processes that are there will make sure that the right outcome is arrived at. And let's this, as far as I'm aware, is the first time this has arisen in in the Scottish uh, prison service with a, a case of this nature. Um, so the right outcome, I think, has been arrived at. There are a very small number of transgender people generally in the prison service, and many of them, in terms of trans women, are in male prisons. Uh, so let's not suggest there is a bigger... The issues are very serious when they arise, but let's not suggest there is a bigger issue here uh, in terms of scale and quantity than there actually is. Do you think that the press at the moment, the way they're dealing with this question, or some of the press, do you think there's transphobia? I wouldn't uh, want to single the press out here, to be fair. Is there transphobia in our society and probably every area of our society? It, yes, it, there is. Is it your view that politicians have weaponised this debate? I think some politicians have, yes. Such as whom? I'm not going to name names because they probably know who they are, but I... Well, I was just struck because the other day you said you talked about there were bad faith actors yeah, who, look, have, look, who have used this, and that's a really look, serious charge. So I'm just wondering, there are, who is well, it? Let me just, I don't, what I don't want to sit here and suggest is that everybody who opposed that bill that, is, because there, as I said, no. there are very, very real concerns. I just happen to think that these concerns are not being caused by this bill. Look, let me put it this way. I have heard people, politicians, claiming to be defenders of women's rights. I've never heard defend women's rights in the past. In fact, I've heard support policies like the rape clause, for example, that run counter to women's rights. We have legislation looming in, later in this parliament on 
criminal justice reform to try to deal with uh, issues of low conviction rates for rape and sexual assault. We are likely to be dealing with legislation in months to come around abortion buffer zones. And I think it will be interesting uh, to see how many of the so-called defenders of women's rights in the context of the trans debate suddenly don't think that all women's rights are actually important. And there are some people that I think have decided to use women's rights as a sort of cloak of acceptability to cover what is transphobia. Now, again, that's not everybody who opposes this bill. I want to be very clear about that. But many, there are people who have opposed this bill uh, that cloak themselves in women's rights to make it acceptable. But just as they're transphobic, you will also find that they're deeply misogynist, uh, often homophobic, possibly some of them racist as well. Members, of the, I, members of the government, you're saying. I'm, you're I'm not, not, going, to I am names, not going to name, and I'm not, but I, I think there is a section of this debate, and I'm, you know, that is the case. There is, there are some people who are using this as a kind of, you know, wedge battering ram, call it what you want. I, I've spent much of my adult life uh, campaigning for women's rights, standing up for it. And you know, one of the things that frustrates me more than anything about this debate is, my goodness, we don't have to look very far to find some very real threats to women right now. You know, in this country, a, a rise in misogyny and abuse, violence against women by predatory and abusive men in you know the United States, an attack on abortion rights, which you start to see uh, in terms of some of the buffer zone debates, uh, echoes of in, in countries like this, you know, fundamental attacks on fundamental freedoms in countries like Iran, Afghanistan. There's no shortage of real threats to women. And as a feminist, that's where I think we should be standing So, so you think up. a lot of these things are not real? A lot of what things are well, not real? Well, I mean, the suggestion, because you're talking about real threats to women. So you think that I they... Don't, the things that some of these bill, people no, are if saying... You, if you go back to what I said earlier real. on, no, no, no. I was very clear. Yeah, sure. Women are not imagining uh, you know, the, the kind of threats that we face every day in terms of violence. Of proportion, perhaps. No, what I'm saying is this bill, refor reforming the process of getting a gender recognition certificate is not a threat to women. Uh, abusive and predatory men are... Any man that sought to abuse any system, of course, you deal with that. But what is a gender recognition certificate? It's basically the ability to have your required gender on your birth certificate. That's it. You don't need a birth, certi a, a birth certificate as a man to enter a woman's only space mm. to abuse a woman. So do men do that? Yes. But not because we're reforming the process of gender recognition. And I, I know you have not much more time. First you've been very, very generous already with the news agent. So just a couple of other questions just on a couple of stories of the week. Are you concerned about... Um, impartiality that BBC at the moment. Do you think that BBC is, we, you'll see in the story with Richard Sharp, is perhaps a little bit too concerned with impartiality in one direction towards the Conservative Party? But whether there is a, a real, you know, debates about the BBC, particularly in Scotland perhaps, are often very uh, intense charged. And, and charged. And, um, you know, I, th I think the BBC is full of really high quality journalists. And so whether there is actual impartiality, I, I think, is. Um, or lack of uh, impartiality, you know, I, I don't know. But is there a perception of partiality with the BBC? I think there is a real danger for the BBC that that is, is starting to be the case. And the Richard Sharp, you know, saga, call it what you want, I don't think helps with that. Um, Do you think he should go, Sharp? Um, I, well, I think, I think there are probably people above him in the queue of uh, folk in public <laughs> office who should resign at the moment. Um, former Chancellor being one of them, but, you know, I, I think he should be reflecting on, given what has emerged about his role, or alleged role, I suppose I should say, in brokering some kind of credit facility for a, a sitting Prime Minister, then perhaps he should reflect if him being the chairman of the BBC, does that help the BBC? Does that help? I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for and supporter of public service broadcasting. I think it's really important, um, but it needs to demonstrate that it meets the test that are required. Should be reflecting on his position. I think, yeah, I think he should. But I think the BBC, I think there should be reflection as well on the, the process of appointing the chairman of the BBC for the future. Uh, you alluded to Nadim Zahawi. You may have seen 
HGH on my C official today who said that there's no way you would get a penalty if something were just careless. I haven't I mean, seen that. But, well, yeah. that's what he said. I mean, um, are you surprised he's still in place? Um, would you I, dismiss got, a minister in your in an equivalent position? It, yes, I, and particularly if you got to the point where I think it is almost you know inescapable to conclude that Rishi Sunak is in where he didn't even get a straight explanation for him and mm. ended up in the House of Commons saying it had all been dealt with when it, it hadn't. It, well, you'd be pretty you, furious if you had to go in front of Holyrood. And, <laughs> it's pretty furious. Okay. It's an understatement. Um, but it goes back to something we were talking about earlier on when you said, am I surprised? If you apply the standards of politics from not that long ago, then yes, I'm surprised he's still in office. But if you apply today's standards, it's well, yeah, because these things just happen. But again, I don't, you were talking earlier on about being a practitioner of politics and all the rest of it. I can't work out what Rishi Sunak thinks he's doing with this because I look at it and I think he is going to presumably have to resign at some right, point. Yeah. Why, why prolong the, the agony? Why not just get it done and, but, you know. And uh, fine, it wouldn't be our podcast news agents, First Minister, without a few quick fires. Oh my goodness. I know, I know. Look, they made me do I it. I hate quick they fires. They made me do it, I right? Really but they are like quick. quick they got Okay, BBC or Netflix? <laughs> I don't watch much telly. Oh, really? I listen to podcasts. Well, quite rightly books. so. We elect this woman, no, take that out. Uh, keep that in. Yeah, 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 keep that in. Uh, Orkney or Shetland? Oh, I can't because they are both you've wonderful, beautiful, yes. but they're also very different. I know, but you've right? got to say one. I can't, no, you, I, I refuse. I'm sorry, oh, I just refuse. God, I can't believe the thing she's about to walk I got, out there. Uh, let me tell you a story about Shetland. I am... Uh, the last time I had serious sunburn, I got it in well, Shetland. Shetland. And who would have believed that? My word, there you go. The cost, the cost of Del Lewick. Um, Thatcher or Truss? <laughs> These are not fair questions. They are so fair. Thatcher or Truss? What, what, what am I choosing? Who do, well, who do, you, uh, who do you admire most? Who do you like? Who do you admire most? Well, look, Thatcher, in a sense, is part of the reason I'm in politics because I opposed everything she stood for, but at least she stood for something. She was a conviction politician and, you know, she <laughs> did the job. I wish she hadn't done it as... Uh, effectively in terms of what she was trying to achieve as, as she did. Let's trust, I'm not sure you can form an opinion on Let's Trust as Prime Minister other than it was a very short term but very big disaster. Harry or William? <laughs> I haven't answered a single one of these questions. I think I should keep up with that. Um, again, very different. <laughs> different people, yeah. Have you read his book? You're a great reader. Have you read Harry's book? Um, I've, I've flipped through some of it, yeah. What mm -hmm. do you think of it? I, look, I, I think... I think it, the bits I have read and much of what I've read has been stuff in the, the media. You know, I think he's trying to tell his story. And I think people, particularly those, you know, who, who want to preserve the monarchy would do well to kind of listen and reflect. They probably don't agree with all of it. But, you know, he tells clearly, you know, childhood trauma, you know, deeply grieving, you know, felt he lived a life that he wasn't able to process that or to be himself, felt that the relationship between the, the royal family and the media is a bit toxic. And, you know, there's lots in there that shouldn't be dismissed, in my view. Does it, should be does it strengthen, I know, I know this is, it's you necessarily care a huge amount about, but does it strengthen your own rec republicanism? I know you've talked about that before, because it's, uh, you know, I've read it. And, my party, my and party policy, of course, is to support the continuation of the monarchy. Indeed it is, but your personal, I mean, I've read it, and the thing I thought about it is, wow, you know what? The effect this actually has on them as individuals, the institution, it's almost bordering on cruelty. At yeah, but I, I suppose, and put aside whether me, anybody else is a, a monarchist or a republican, even if you support your people who support the monarchy, I'm not sure it has to be like that. Yeah. You know, th that's why I'm saying I think supporters of the monarchy should probably reflect on it because it is everything. And the monarchy itself. Yeah, indeed, the, the monarchy king itself. Himself. Well, I think it, well, you know, I. I'm sure he is as a father as, as well as a king, but you know, all of the experience Harry has had, and you know, he's telling it from his point of view, but all of that experience, um, all of that, was that inevitable? You know, is that just part and parcel of being born into a royal family? And does it have to be like that? And that, that's where the I think. Coronation? Um, of course. Really? Yes. Do you like the pageantry? Not I'm not a great kind of, fan of no. pageantry, but you know, I I don't. It's not for. It's not my decision how much pageantry there will Gonna be. Going to cost a hundred million quid, apparently. You think that's a good use um, of public money? 
I think it should be responsibly done and, and cost effectively done. And, and you know, I, I'm pretty certain about this, actually, that the, the king will want that to be the case. One more quick fire and then we're done. And this is probably the toughest one of all. John Soap or Emily Maitlis? <laughs> um, Emily. <sighs> Sorry, John. Uh, uh, John's great. Uh, the last time I, I saw John in person, I think, might have been when we had a, a drink in Washington. He's had a drink with everybody in Washington, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, First Minister, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Really appreciate you giving us lots of that. That is really <laughs> saved by the bell. That's for you, John. Thank you so much, First Minister. Thank you. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast.